young person, I struggled. What's the will of God? You know, and uh, actually, your grandmother. Flowers or? No, not grandmother. Your, what would she be? Dorothy Jakes. No, she's not your grandmother. She'd be, she'd be your, your uncle's mother-in-law. Okay, okay. She was our youth leader, and I remember she lived right across the street from the, um, uh, from the high school. And I remember walking over there one time when I was in, in 11th grade and I was struggling with, you know, what's the will of God and how do you know what the will of God is? And so I thought, you know, Sister Jakes would have the answer. And so I went over and I talked to her and she said, um, she said, yeah, she said, when, when you're in the will of God, you will know it. And I thought, great, that helped a lot, you know. <laughs> but you know what? It's true. it's true. God begins opening doors and you begin to walk through them and God just gives you peace and you do know when you're in the will of God. So... One of the funniest things that we've, that, well, on deputation you see a lot of stuff. Deputation is, is real eye-opener. Um, this last deputation, we went to this little church where everyone in the church was, had major problems. The pastor uh, had obviously had a stroke, I would say, the pastor's wife, and they, they weren't old, they were young. The pastor's wife had a walker, and everybody in the church was in, kind of in the same boat. The pastor couldn't talk. Uh, he, he just sort of like would say one or two words, and um, when he get up to pray, he asked for prayer requests, and of course everybody had to pray for themselves because they all had needs, and, and so he just, he just get up there and he prayed. He said, God, you heard it all, amen. <laughs> and then, then, then he turned, turned to me, he said, it's yours. And after church, he come to me, he said, you need to eat and I said no no we're fine he said good I gotta work tomorrow and he walked out the door that was kind of funny but but you see all kinds of things that happen on 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 deputation uh, most of it's really good but some of it can be quite hilarious but we also had another guy come one time and uh, it was when I was just learning Spanish and I, I couldn't translate for him and the missionaries we were working with were gone away and so they had a girl that lived in their house that could speak a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of English. And so this guy wanted to testify to the church. And so I said, well, Sister Veronica can testify, can translate for you, but keep it simple and she can do it. Well, everybody that comes to Guatemala always says the same thing. They always say how, how happy they are to be there and that even though they can't speak the same language, God understands all languages and, and the worship here is the same as the worship, you know, feel the same God as we do back in North America. They're, they're kind of a canned testimony right. and we always know what they're going to say. But this guy gets up and supposedly he's going to keep it simple. He got going on about regeneration and justification and sanctification and that poor girl, her face went ash and white and I just said to her, I said, just do the normal testimony. And so while he was going on about sanctification, justification, and about the piercings in the hand of Christ, and he was weeping, she was saying, I'm so glad to be here. And the same spirit here is the same spirit in North America. Of course, the people didn't know any better, but I was sitting over there dying, laughing, and she was having a fit. But it's, it's so funny. What is the most common question that you are asked regarding missions work by potential aimers and stuff like that? Uh, what type of work they would be involved in. And what is the answer to that question? Uh, <laughs> it's like you said that's, you don't, you that's like a huge, that you know what? The whole deal with someone going down for short-term missions, if they will come with the attitude that we want to lighten the load of the missionaries and do whatever our hands find to do, that's huge. The problem with too many is they come down thinking, I want to do this, this, and this, and they have a preconceived idea. Um, nobody can understand what the work is like in any given mission field until you're there. And if you're going and you want to be in the limelight and you want to be behind a pulpit preaching all the time, that's probably not going to happen because most of the time a lot of our work is behind the scenes and basically to keep a work running, it just takes a lot of work. Right. And we just need people that can come that are willing to, to work and to do whatever there is to do. And there are times that, yes, they can preach. They don't have to preach. They can sing. They don't have to sing. The truth of the matter is, in most of our countries, we've got lots of preachers. Mm -hmm. We need people that can help us uh, keep the wheels moving. And probably 
the, the nationals connect more with nat- national preachers. Totally, than, totally. Than visiting American or Canadian or whatever. Well, and most people that come can't speak the language. So if you can't speak the language, um, what can you do? Yeah, that's a, a big hindrance right there. Yeah, and if I'm going to interpret for you, I might as well preach. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or let a national do it or whatever. Yeah, and it's not that, I mean, there are opportunities to, to preach and to do stuff like that, but really the bottom line is it, it, it's work, and we do we do ask when aimers come down or short term people that they go to language school in Guatemala. We've got some phenomenal language schools. Mm-hmm. They have these schools that you go to, and you're one on one with a teacher, and so they take you where you're at, and we'll take you to the next level, and it's very very effective. And so we like our our helpers to at least get a couple of weeks of language school. That way, they're a little bit independent. They can order their own food. They can ask directions, you know. Yeah. And uh, of course, in Guatemala, there's lots of opportunities. We've got a huge Bible school program, a lot of opportunities there. We have a children's home that is tons of opportunities. I have 42 church buildings under construction right now. If you want to build something, um, we have 17 districts, which means there's 17 district conferences, there's 17 conventions, there's there's. 17 places with youth conventions and all kinds of stuff going on. So there's lots of opportunity to be involved. That's awesome. That's, that's massive. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a pretty big operation now. What advantages or disadvantages do you feel, um, and you would know this of course by raising, from raising three kids on the mission field, mm-hmm. but what advantages and disadvantages come from growing up on a mission field? I think there's more advantages than disadvantages. Uh, simply, okay, let me see. My kids were born there and raised. Um, they are bilingual. Uh, they have three nationalities. Um, they are very open-minded because they grew up in cross-cultural, uh, not just Spanish and American, but the school they go to is about 30% Korean, which is kind of surprising. Uh, when kids grow up in a place like that, their worldview is completely different than growing up in North America. One of the benefits is they're not wrapped up in brand names and stuff like that. Um, Disadvantages, uh, Guatemala, for instance, is a very uh, violent country by times. There's a lot of, like a large, a huge crime rate. And so they're more limited in freedom. Probably as parents, we were probably a bit more overprotective than North American parents would be. Uh, You know, we live in 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 a community with 42 houses and that community's walled in. We have armed guards at the gate. And then our property has 12 foot walls around it with barbed wire. And then inside that, our house has bars on the windows and doors. And so in the beginning, when you go down, you kind of feel like you're in prison, but we like it because our kids could play out in our yard. We never had to worry about them. They'd have to climb over a 12 foot fence to get out into the street, you know? But um, I think the, the benefits of it outweigh the, uh, the, the the drawbacks. Anywhere you live has its pros and cons, and Guatemala's no difference, different in it at all. Um, our kids, if you ask them today, are thrilled that they had the opportunity to grow up in a country like Guatemala. And uh, when they're, I got two boys that's in North America, when they have holidays, they want to come home to Guatemala. You know, it's, it's home to them. And so, you know, I, I think it's, um, and now that they're in college, they're not wanting to stay in North America. The world's, the world's their playground. They, they want to go anywhere and work, you know. So, so I, you know, I, I think there's, uh, there's pluses and minuses. Uh, the church situation was awesome for them. Very vibrant churches, vibrant worship. Uh, all that's been very, very good. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, it was a huge adventure for us. Our first year that we were there, we had this one little, like a little bachelor apartment. Literally the bathroom was so small, you had to go in in the door sideways to get into it, it was really funny. 